Thank you, everyone, for joining our webinar today, where we'll discuss the role APIs play in transforming your business and technology. We're honored to have as our guest speaker, Randy Hefner, Vice President and Principal Analyst at Forrester Research. With nearly 40 years in the industry, Randy guides clients in how APIs, microservices, and other trends foster sustainable business agility for innovation in customer engagement and business partner value chain. Also presenting today is Nuan Diaz, Vice President and Deputy CTO of API Management and Integration at WSO2. He leads the product vision and roadmap and works closely with WSO2's customers, helping them to align their API strategies and architectures. And now uh, with that, let me turn it over to Randy. Thank you, Rebecca. Is that the, uh, there we go, we got the camera going. So transform business and technology, you know, and with APIs, you know, one of the interesting things that I sometimes hear about APIs is people will talk about APIs as integration. You know, we're doing API-based integration or something like that. And the, the thing that gets me about that, when they talk about it that way, is that certainly APIs are not less than integration but they are much, much more than integration. And so that's the first half of what I wanna, what I wanna talk about. So how do, they re, how do they transform your business, change your business strategy, enable whole new ways of doing business? And, uh, but then when it comes to uh, you know, changing your technology, really has to do with, not so much changing your technology, but changing the structures by which you deliver your solutions so that you create business agility for optimization internal and external. And yes, below all that, APIs are integration and APIs do integration and business integration and tech integration and the like. But but we want to start with a bigger picture. And what hopefully will help you begin to connect if you aren't already there in terms of APIs transforming your business is a little bit of data. So we ask a variety of, uh, of questions about APIs and other technologies. And, and one of them is, so what architecture styles do you do? Um, and APIs internally, externally. I'm gonna look at APIs exposed externally and drill down on some of that, that data. Uh, but specifically, what I wanna do is connect that question to the question of what's revenue growth at your organization been? lately because it's very this very interesting correlation where now if we look at the 47 percent that say that they currently use uh, apis externally versus the 27 percent that don't the group of the 27 percent that don't only nine percent of them report having high revenue growth 15 percent or more but it's it's double that for the group that that are doing apis externally 20 percent and what's interesting about this is if you go down the revenue bands, you know, to revenue growth 10 to 15 percent, you know, five to 10 percent, zero, all the way down to negative 15 percent revenue growth, there's this smooth kind of curve where at the until at the bottom these these percentages are switched, where the much higher percentage is of those that are not interested in ABIs have revenue growth that uh, negative 15%, that's the higher versus uh, versus the other. This is correlation, not causation. That causation could run either direction. It could be, well, we're doing APIs and we've been able to do lots of interesting business things. Anecdotally, I hear lots of those kinds of stories. But I also hear stories that are, we, are, we really need to change our business. And so we are doing APIs and the changing of business part is what, what's driving revenue growth. And APIs is just facilitating that. But, but there's a correlation. That's important. What's going on? Why are why are APIs doing uh, doing this? Particularly when we think about them externally, it's important to understand that that we've shifted a long time ago. We shifted, but but really it's becoming more and more clear if you if you haven't already caught it. But it was since 2005 that I first published this notion that it's not two things. It's not business and then figure out technology. That's a dead end, you know, to, to start to try to understand what your strategy is and then put technology behind it. It's one thing. It's digital business as one thing. You know, digital as an adjective, business as one thing. 
And what that means is that your business is a digital business. I haven't heard this question as much recently, but there was a, a, a while, maybe even up to two, three years ago, where people would have this question of, are we going to go digital or be a digital business or not? I'm sorry, you don't have a choice. You are a digital business. The only question is whether you're built for agility as a digital business or not, because your business can change only as fast as your technology does when it's one thing. And it is one thing, you are a digital business. And this was driven home to me in an interesting way by looking at PSD2. So, okay, now we're into the, the, the days of PSD2 being live. And I, I'll just say, I have never heard of a bank complying with PSD2 where it is not via APIs. In other words, every 100% of the banks that I know of that, that say we're, we're complying with PSD2, APIs are a major part of the story. But if you go to the 45,000 words in the PS2, PSD2 document itself that, that was adopted, then digital occurs in that document nine times. Computer, twice. API is nowhere in PSD2. But by saying 45,000 words of how banks need to operate in the future, they implied that 100% of the banks are going to need to do APIs. That's how, in, how deeply infused APIs are and technology is into business these days. And so you have to, you have to understand that. But you know, I said APIs are much more than integration. That depends on how you design your APIs and what kind of APIs you're actually delivering. And so let's look at the most important kinds of APIs. Uh, and I, I refer to them as business APIs. So you're trying to do as a business as part of your transformation, do excellent service or streamline internal operations or do these whole new business models, new markets, things like a telco that used it billing APIs to stand up and a new business line as an external service billing service provider, um, or banks that have that have you know, pursued business agility internally and then created deep ecosystems with fintechs to drive new markets, new business models. Well, how do they do that? That's by, it's a focus fundamentally on what is the bank good at? What do we do? What can we do? What are our capabilities? And and these are the things that are buried in, often for a bank, very deep in enterprise applications and legacy applications. Business APIs are about putting plugs on these, if you will, so that you can turn your enterprise, bank, manufacturer, insurance, retailer, whatever, into a platform that can recombine and, and, and reconfigure these business capabilities to deliver this this kind of pitch, uh, transformation and change. But let me be clear that, that, for example, an API into the credit score capability is not an API, not a low level integration API into the credit scoring app or legacy or otherwise. It is an API into credit scoring as a capability that may involve more than, than, than that one app or may involve multiple apps, but the design point is not which app are we going to connect to? The design point of a business API is what is the capability that we want to be able to deliver to business processes, user experience, dynamic ecosystems, and, and the like. That's the important design point. So you start to think of the business much more as a set of capabilities that, that you can go to market with. And the traditional way of thinking about the business is sort of all up, if you will, all of the capabilities that are required to go to market as an auto manufacturer or a, a satellite imaging company you know, or, or whatever it might be. But open business thinking says we're going to create each one of these capabilities inside the company such that if we wanted to, we could take something that we're good at, product design or factory design, 
and go to market with those individual capabilities. This is what I was referring to a moment ago with the telco who said, we're good at billing. Why don't we just sell billing externally separate from our core business as a telco? APIs are fundamentally what enable that kind of capability. And then you start organizing around these domains, these business capabilities. And, and so we hear, we see organizations organizing blended teams, business teams, with business and technology staff around domains. Uh, so you may hear people, uh, organizations talking about, we're moving from being a project focused delivery organization to a product focused organization. And when when I hear people say that, I like to, to say, well, what, what, product, what, what is a product to you? What do you mean? And at most often they will respond with some business capability. You know, we, it's account management, it's trading, it's actuarial uh, analysis or, or loan qualification, whatever the, the capability is. And so we're approaching the design and implementation of the business in an it's one thing kind of way, a digital business kind of way by organizing blended teams around business capabilities, driving those forward, sometimes cooperating you know, across domains to deliver a bigger business transformation, sometimes taking an individual domain and going to business separately uh, with that domain. So one direction that you can take that that I like to talk about is platform business models, because you really start to think of the business as a platform that can deliver these capabilities in different ways. And so you might have a number of different ways that you form a business model, a, a go-to-market strategy around a platform. Well, one of the, the, the most important, most impactful, most well-known kinds of platform uh, models out there right now is, is the marketplace model that Amazon, Alibaba, you know, others, uh, you know, around the, the world within their market seg more geo segments, typically, uh, you know, they, they create a platform that sellers can create virtual presence uh, on. And in Amazon's case, like now 2 million more or more sellers around the world sell through their platform. Well, Amazon created that platform by saying, starting and saying, we're good at e-commerce. We're doing our own e-commerce thing. You know, they were famous for books early on, obviously, but, but that little arrow that goes from A to Z means they wanted to be able, from the beginning, wanted to be able to sell anything. But when they moved to the marketplace model, it was like taking those core e-commerce capabilities, adding a couple other capabilities and packaging it in a way that buyers could, uh, could or excuse me, sellers could now uh, stand up their own presence uh, on that. And... So now, right, uh, uh, you know, in a whole range of scenarios, Amazon is taking a cut of a sale that it never touches the products on. Uh, even for things that, or, or sometimes it'll add physical capabilities like warehousing or fulfillment that sellers will add those kind of physical capabilities with the digital market platform. So a variety of things here, but it's a different way of connecting buyers and sellers, and there's a platform to do that, and the platform involves core capabilities of the the, the marketplace um, it, you, uh, it firm, my Amazon in this case. There are other cases where, let's say, GE predicts where the company creates a platform that's oriented around a particular business domain, and customers use that platform so that the platform here is more a separate product, if you if you will. But there might be business extension kinds of scenarios. Um, so a typical example here might be a Salesforce app exchange where they have a core platform for all their Salesforce apps. Um, but there's an extension platform, if you will, that allows a variety of Salesforce App Exchange vendors, software uh, customers, to basically get access to Salesforce customers to add on to the value that, that Salesforce provides. 
But what's more interesting to me rather than that kind of thing is, for example, a nonprofit that I was talking uh, talking to about their API strategy who wanted to have an extension platform for so that they could provide additional services and interesting capabilities to their the stakeholders of that nonprofit, the people who were uh, members, if you will, or had other interest in what the nonprofit was doing. Uh, and the, that be, became an, a, a revenue stream for the nonprofit, as well as additional value for the nonprofit's customers. But underneath all these, the most powerful sort of way to think about a platform model is that the company is the platform and this is how that that telco uh w it delivered its billing capability if, if you will it was basically the same apis that they were using internally for customer service with some other things wrapped around it to deliver this whole new business line operating off the the, the company we see you know i mentioned you know some some banks for example collaborating with fintechs for loan qualification that can be the same loan qualification capabilities and apis that the bank itself is using for its own business uh, and so this really opens up a much wider variety of things and a much more important reason for thinking about business apis and having a strong business api strategy as part of your api initiative so Hopefully here you're getting the sense, you know, as we talk about these different kinds of ecosystems that may be connected and these sort of new adjacent ecosystems, like the uh, I mentioned one more time, the, the telco with the billing, you know, they, they're reaching to a whole adjacent ecosystem there. Uh, hopefully you're getting some, some understanding that uh, of what I mean when I say APIs are much, much more than integration. It's business change, business strategy but they do change how you do technology. So the sort of the turning point here is to think in terms of, well, how do we implement these business APIs? Well, the, the interesting thing here is that they are a break point, an insulation point, if you will, so that maybe within one of those major domains, order management here, that we deliver the implementations behind these APIs in a variety of different ways. Maybe one is fully microservice based behind, another is just a pass through to some business partner or the like who does order fulfillment in this case maybe. Um, or maybe we have a legacy application that we're just doing APIs directly into the legacy via some integration technology or putting microservices in front of that. Um, or, or even pushing the processing off to uh, to asynchronous offline kind of thing by just capturing the order uh, you know that's coming in and uh, and making sure that we have it persistently reliably captured so that we can pursue an eventual consistency model behind it. A bunch of different ways that we can that we can implement that's all transparent to anything above the business API. But let's look at a little deeper inside a given domain and let's assume for example that it's fully microservice based then we have to figure out how to coordinate multiple layers of apis and different ways of thinking about a microservice and and the domain driven design concepts around a microservice so this is picking up on some of those product management themes with that blended teams are doing that i mentioned a moment ago and so we got this order management domain. There's a blended team that is focused on that domain. We got a number of other domains, and uh, and we're gonna have a number of microservices in each one of the domains. Okay, again, I'm going down the path of what if it's all microservices to the core? You know, in a brand new you know greenfield kind of environment, or something where we have converted legacy into a, a microservice environment. Well, the what we often hear people saying is, well, something like, how will one of my microservices find another among the thousands that we have across the organization? In other words, they're, they're not viewing there's any boundaries between these domains or any bounding of domains. They're thinking any microservice should be able to talk to any other little deployment unit across the whole enterprise. That is not a microservice architecture. That's a microservice mess. 
So the reason we have the domains here is be because if you have that flat landscape where anything can talk to anything directly across all the domains, it's a recipe for a lot of tangled interconnections and unmanageable dependencies and, and such. So what do we do? Answer again, business APIs at the edge of the domain, delivering the capabilities of the domain. So we're focused again on the same kinds of business capabilities that deliver a business platform model. Might be internal business agility we're pursuing. It might be uh, it, it might be new business models and and the like. But you know, other domains have their capabilities, and that's the level of granularity that we talk between domains. Domain services, things that the domain team has intentionally decided are going to be exposed, if you will, at the edge of the domain, beyond the domain. And there are microservices that implement those business APIs and know how to orchestrate across the APIs internally. And then we need to, to across this have, uh, have uh, you know, life cycle stages and control in, at the appropriate times, at the appropriate ways for, del for creating APIs and for publishing and using APIs. But the solutions are around that, you know, API management, service mesh, et, et cetera, have to understand and reflect these boundaries because these private APIs, for example, well, they're APIs, someone might say, well, why don't we publish those to the world? Well, because they're private. So the domain team decides when and where and how to, to publish those. And the technology should allow them to remain private not visible to the rest of the organization, even internally, much less externally outside of the organization. These are questions of how you run and control the life cycle and visibility and, and manage relationships between API users and API providers. But APIs then are also driving, as we talk about uh, how they relate to microservices, are driving some transformation at the, in concert with the cloud native architectures that are that are driving microservice kind of packaging of, of well services more and, and 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 applications more generally but certainly apis as well so there's transformation of technology at that level as well where you need to have you know, it's a blended foundation you know the, the the different requirements of any individual domain may require different platform elements one domain may be very analytics driven another may be iot driven another is heavily transaction driven but so a, a team that's creating platforms to deliver modern applications has to be able to adapt the the platform to different domain requirements so what I want to draw up here is a, a high-level reference architecture for how you form a platform for a domain. And it starts by understanding how you manage the edge of the domain. API management is a big conversation these days, but uh, and, and it's important. It's the best thing going in terms of thinking about how do I manage the edge of a domain. But there'll be events that need to cross domain boundaries, either as event source or event sync, publishing or subscribing to events, or data mechanisms, or even file transfer as a data integration mechanism, a variety of things that might go in and out of the domain. We need to define that and manage who can access what across the domain edge boundary between our domains internally and, again, certainly externally. And we're going to have microservices within that domain. Microservice should not be conflated with API. I don't think they're the same thing. Think of microservices as a deployment concept. APIs and, and domain edge, whether it's events or APIs or other mechanisms, as how you get to that functionality. It, it's important to keep those separate because the architectures are separate, but also because a microservice might deliver a visual stream. It might deliver a hunk of HTML for a web page. And so microservices are visual as well, which is another reason you don't want to conflate them with APIs. But you have a number of different you know, ways of building microservices. As you think about the platform underneath, you have to allow in these days that the 
that there are multiple kinds of platforms that might be underneath that need to work together cohesively, be both for, or, you know, all first class citizens within the domain, but there might be a core microservice platform that's container based, and that will typically be Kubernetes these days, or there could be uh, you know, you know, other kinds of uh, uh, container containerized kind of environments, but there might be also other ways of building microservices like function as a service, integration platform as a service. You, you're, platform needs to be able to draw from either one of those uh, kinds of platforms. And not only that, we're going to get bring up another piece in, in, in just a moment. But when we're building all these microservices, you know, it, well, let me put it this way. If you look at a mainstream developer, someone who's focused on delivering business capabilities, not focused on on all the latest open source project and and all the you know, the neat new standards and how to, to do high end microservices. Mainstream, if you look at a mainstream developer and say, I need a, a high end eventual consistency transaction, uh, you know, for doing uh, you know, it, you know uh, foreign exchange transactions that are going to deliver millions, or, you know, in a single API call, uh, and if you didn't get sort of a deer in the headlights look making that request of typical mainstream developer you should be afraid because that's a very difficult thing to do well how do you enable them you create patterns so that they can create code that might be packaged in multiple different ways through an active governed pipeline that creates you know image libraries for containerized or or alternate microservice deployments uh, and, and you know, a lot of governance and uh, and and expertise packaged, if you will, in between the pipeline, the pattern, and how we form the, the platform. And that, that should include monoliths as well. Your old legacy monoliths, certainly, but monoliths are with us uh, you know, just to stay, even if you're like, well, we're all cloud-based, so we do a bunch of SaaS applications and everything. That SaaS application is a black box. You don't get to change the inside of it. You have to deal with it as it is. And so that needs to be a first class part of the architecture and then deeply infused monitoring across all that. That's, that there's a lot more detail to, to, to bring to the table underneath this. But what I want to do is say you've got to be organized around the, the, the kind of platform that your organizations will use. It, kind of summarizing here, everything is changing at once. You know, Changing at the level of how we pursue dynamic ecosystems and business and new business models and and you know deep digital bonding, not via just REST APIs, but events and everything across external enterprise boundaries and how the virtual enterprise of, uh, of these days is built. And that's the business side. And on the technical side, everything is changing as well. New patterns, new solution architectures, new in new processes and, and mechanisms for building solutions, new ideas about how we package, it, you know, the, what goes into production with infrastructure as code and, and the like, and just all manner of new platforms that, it's, that, that these are running on. Cloud native is about, uh, a cloud native solution architecture is about all of the, the, what's on the right here. On the left is about dynamic ecosystems, but it's all, digital business. And, and so you can't get there all at once. It has to be an evolutionary, what I call a success first street level strategy. The old way, wrong way of doing this is to say, well, we got this strategic vision. Let's, you know, we, we, and we're way down here, you know, nowhere near that vision at the moment. But in order to get there, what we have to do is create a platform, you know, kind of to kind of do this uh, like get more and more technology, mature our technology, and then we're ready to to, to build new business directions and new business things. No, no, that's that's the wrong approach, wrong way to think about it. The old top-down ivory tower architecture kind of thing it, that that doesn't work. What you need to do is focus on what's the business value we need to deliver. What's the least amount of platform we can put in place to build toward that success and, and and create new business value. And that may be by first starting with a good insulation layer of business APIs 
that may have messy implementations underneath, but you can deliver high levels of business value on top. I'll come back one last time to that telco example. It's a favorite example because it just it sort of, if you will, by accident happened that they did the the uh, the external billing service provider thing, but they were focused just on let's get good business APIs that help us drive internal change and then realize, oh, wait a minute, we've got these other opportunities. But what was behind that may, you know, may not have been the prettiest things. So that's how you're going to, to, to get from an integration view of APIs to a view of APIs that really is the center of transforming your business but also enabling the transformation of your technology. Nuon, over to you. Thank you, Randy. And uh, thank you for, for your great insight um, and sharing all of that information with, uh, with us. And welcome uh, once again, guys, uh, to uh, today's presentation. Uh, as Rebecca uh, introduced me, I'm uh, Nuon Das. I'm the VP and Deputy City for uh, API Management Integration and WSO2. Um, so I uh, hope to talk to you about how um, APIs enable uh, your business um, and, and your technology, uh, or rather transform. So, so to begin with, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, delivering business value to customers. So uh, as you all know, uh, all of you are from different kinds of industries, and uh, it could be banking, finance, healthcare, um, travel and leisure, whatever that is. And each of your organizations you own have um, the your wealth of your organizations, which could be your data, which could be your services that you offer uh, digitally, and so on. So we, uh, as consumers, or, or your business as consumers, consume these business values through some uh, form of applications. So if you think of a, a very simple di uh, digital product, so if you think of a product like, um, like Google Search, which I'm pretty sure most of us uh, must have used or are using on a day-to-day -day basis, Right, so we, we consume Google searches capability, basically the ability to search the whole World Wide Web uh, through various forms of client uh, applications. So it could be like Google.com, it could be the, the our browser tab, which we type search queries on, it could, it could be uh, the Google search um, application, the mobile application, and so on. Right, so, so Google uh, has this uh, wealth of data, which happens to be uh, an index of the whole uh, World Wide Web, and of course, the algorithms that run on top of that data. So this is basically uh, Google's wealth. And this this wealth of information is delivered uh, to consumers uh, like us who use it on a day-to-day -day basis uh, through the Google Search API. So you as an organization um, uh, has its wealth, similar to what uh, Google has. Uh, in terms of your data or services, and uh, they are consumed or experienced by your customers through some form of applications, and APIs become the mode of delivery uh, of that value uh, to your consumers uh, through various kinds of applications. So this is basically uh, how APIs enable your organization's uh, value to be exposed uh, to your uh, customers. And, and as I see it, APIs do really um, two valuable things. This may seem like simple things, but they're really important, right? APIs uh, connect your customers to the data and your services, and uh, they do it really simply. So if you, if you, so Plaid is a company that um, uh, did something wonderful. So they, they took uh, what you would call uh, as typically a legacy or, or hard to consume um, by uh, banking services of different banks um, uh, in the world, basically. And so the, these banks had this legacy hard-to-consume services. So what Plate did was they, they created a really simple set of uh, APIs that consume these banking services and expose these APIs in a way that was simple to consume by uh, various kinds of uh, client applications. And, and that simple process, made played such a valuable company. So uh, it's not like played invented any APIs as such because these were all services that were already existing. So the only thing that they did for the most part was 
they took all of these hard to consume and legacy services and gave a new facade to it and what and that made it really valuable because it made it possible for any kind of application like like a loan application or a mortgage application or whatever that is uh, that had to deal with finance uh, or for making or receiving payments uh, that made it possible for these applications to use these services of of these banks so that that hard work that played did made them a really valuable company and they were acquired by uh, visa for 5.5 billion dollars uh, or, or something like that uh, a couple of years back so uh, the, the 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 point i want to make here is that like apis enable your business new uh, really new business opportunities um, that you may have never uh, seen before so and if you look at look at the the digital world that's around us today uh, something that we have to realize our apis are basically building the entire foundation of the of our whole digital experience that we are experiencing uh, today everything from from like the finance app that i talked to um, uh, talked about before and um, if you think of a simple scenario where um, you wanted to build build a um, like you wanted to find uh, someone on a date uh, and uh, so if you if you think of building an application that would enable this right so you have today uh, facebook's apis or, or instagram's apis that will help you to find someone who you're interested in uh, someone like you could query by using these apis uh, by gender by by where they live uh, by by their relationship status and all of that and these apis would help you find uh, people uh, that you are willing to uh, go on a date with and then you could use uh, yelp's apis to to find a restaurant uh, find find a nice restaurant and make a reservation and you could use the uh, the calendar apis to uh, basically find a date and a time uh, for you to make that reservation so you could build you could use these apis of different providers and build an application that enables this uh, exp- this digital experience so so the, the the fundamental point i want to make here is that our entire digital experience is basically being built upon uh, by apis so as you each one of you are, are from your own organization like what you have to figure out is uh, how can your organization contribute to this uh, digital ecosystem uh, what is the value that you have within your organization that can basically contribute or, or how can you make your organization part of this digital web that is being built uh, through apis and and how can uh, these data or your services be used by uh, these kinds of applications so this is this is an exercise that um, uh, everyone needs to find out or are in the process of finding out and another important thing is that you you may all already have figured out um what you have and how you can offer it to um to your consumers and this could be figured out by by your customer demands maybe or by your organization's uh, strategic plans um and so on but another uh, beautiful thing that apis enable is that once you have all of these uh, services like api enabled uh <clears throat> it also gives you a platform to see what your customers aren't asking for to see new possibilities right of course you have to build and de- deliver what your customers are asking for but once you have these things all of your services organized into apis and and in a visual way basically um uh, through some kind of a portal or through something like that and when you analyze all of your capabilities you start seeing things and possibilities that you didn't see before so that is also another um a major part of uh, uh major part of what apis enable your business to become so to 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 nurture this uh, ability in your organization uh, you have to basically transform your organization into uh, what we call an api uh, product factory so in order to enable this you have to think of your apis uh, as as products because apis now become the way your organization's uh, services are consumed by your customer basically apis fundamentally become the foundation of uh, how your organization's digital capabilities are being exposed 
uh, to your consumers and therefore they have to be treated as products within your organization so to to build this uh, culture to build this mindset in your organization you have to think about uh, creating what we call as an api product factory uh, within your organization so what is an api product factory so that's basically uh, a, a set of processes and practices and, and mindsets uh, that take your organization's digital capabilities and convert them uh, into apis so this starts at um, the manufacturing phase where you build different pieces of your apis internally so uh, as randy has been showing in, in in his presentation so this could be building independent microservices uh, that become part of apis eventually um or, or and so on right and this could even be building different kinds of event streams uh, different types of apis including like grpc graphql um, like uh, regular rest and so on so it uh, it starts at the manufacturing phase of your apis and then you get on to the assembly phase of your apis so uh, the assembly is about building those apis so in the manufacturing phase you build the building blocks that are needed for your apis and at the assembly phase you assemble these together to give those business apis or the uh, edge apis that randy has been uh, talking about throughout his presentation so this could include um, various kinds of integration between different systems like legacy systems uh, uh, some microservices that you built newly some services that are um, on the cloud basically like uh, uh, serverless functions and so on um and then we get into the phase of packaging these apis so packaging is about how you produce your apis into your uh, consumers this is about uh, attaching the relevant documentation for the correct audiences uh, associating the business plans to your apis which applies in the case of um, when you want to monetize your apis which is a separate conversation uh it also has to deal with um categorization of apis into different categories uh, that that are relevant to your organization um and also creating a packaging apis in such a way where it becomes uh, easy and pleasant for the consumers to uh, consume these apis uh and the next phase of building this api product factory is figuring out uh, how do you deliver these apis to your consumers so as we know today Uh, there are various platforms for delivering these apis out into the market so this could be some parts of it could be on prem some parts of it could be in the cloud and <clears throat> there are different uh, api marketplaces out there uh, do you go through these marketplaces do you build your own marketplace for for your apis and so on so you figure out the delivery model of your apis and finally uh, none of this becomes a reality unless you figure out the correct automation process uh, for all of this so this is about building that api uh, fact, product mindset within your organization and and converting your organization's uh, processes and practices and technologies uh, to create this practice of an api product uh, factory so this is one of the most important things uh, to establish in order to take your organization's capabilities and services out into the market in the form of apis so wso2 uh, offers a, a, a set of products that can help you in building this api product factory uh, the the main uh, product of it being uh, the api management platform which uh, i'll quickly explain uh, certain parts of it which has like a management plane data plane and a control plane the management plane uh, deals with things like uh, building your api interfaces controlling the life cycle of your um, apis and so on uh it also includes the developer portal where your apis will be discovered by your consumers and so on and the business insights part where when your apis are up and uh, running uh, this this component will generate various kinds of insights that will be uh, important for your organization to make uh, decisions uh, in the future uh and then the data plane is about the the delivery model of your api so we that uh, that uh, includes an api gateway an api micro gateway for uh, cloud native and uh, kubernetes like solutions service mesh integrations uh, kubernetes plugins and, and various um, other tools that that uh, deal with the problem of delivering your apis to uh, to various consumers 
The control plane is about the governance of your APIs. It basically controls who can access your APIs, controls the security part, the rate limits, uh, like just anomaly detection and all, all these kinds of things. So uh, this is one of the most important components that are required uh, in order to uh, get your organization into a practice of um, exposing APIs of your digital services. And this is basically uh, complemented by um, enterprise integration. So we have an enterprise integrator, which is required for integrating different systems. So if you're um, if you're paying attention, you would have uh, heard Randy uh, talking about you know building a success path first uh, rather than focusing on a technology uh, path first. So this is where enterprise integration can become essentially important because that enables you to connect uh, different systems, uh, whether they are modern or legacy. It doesn't really matter and create that uh, facade or API layer that you can expose uh, to your consumers. A and then comes on identity and access management, which basically becomes an essential part of any architecture nowadays, uh, whether it's cloud native, legacy or, or monolith or microservices, it doesn't really matter. Uh, so for various advanced uh, identity and access management capabilities, you need some of these uh, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, and so on, these kinds of capabilities uh, to, to basically expose your APIs out into the uh, market. So as, as uh, I hope it's clear, we have a, we have what we're talking about here is not just about creating technical APIs, but also about creating a product mindset for your APIs. Now, if APIs are basically going to be your products, and you should be thinking of your APIs as your products, then you have a new customer base now to be thinking about. So you, you, your organization will have its regular customer base, but as APIs become your products, um, you now have a new customer base who are the, the, the consumers of your APIs, basically the developers of, your, uh, of various kinds of applications that deliver your business value uh, at the end of the day to the consumer base. So how do you treat or how do you enable this, this new customer base that you have to deal with? Uh, so I'll talk about a few points that are important to basically address this new segment or new market uh, who are the API consumers or the application uh, developers. So some of the things that you have to be focusing on uh, in order to cater this market is to make your APIs uh, discoverable, meaning um, that uh, you should be using some kind of an API uh, user portal where your API should be uh, like tagged, uh, categorized appropriately, where you have certain uh, search functionality that, that assists developers to find the APIs that they're interested in and, and so on. So what you see on the right is a picture of the New Zealand um, government's um, API portal where they have categorized the APIs by various uh, ministries. And this is built on top of the WSO2 uh, platform. And another key important aspect of a good product is that it, 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 it's easy to use. So your APIs have to be uh, easy to use, which is fundamentally what uh, Plaid did uh, when they transformed legacy ba banking services into uh, modern APIs. So this is also about um, using an API uh, user portal and also having intuitive uh, interfaces for your APIs, like if they can, if, if people can understand your APIs without reading any documentation, that's basically the perfect uh, situation that uh, that everyone wants. And when it comes to documentation, there's of course technical documentation which is, which is required to understand how uh, the API has to be consumed and how it works. And then there's also the business documentation, which is also important because uh, consumers of your APIs need to make a case for for their management in order to go and use these APIs. So your, your API documentation also has to talk uh, business language in the sense, uh, uh, talk uh, or, or rather tell why it's important from a business perspective, like whether, it's, uh, whether it generates additional revenue directly to the organization or indirectly, um, whether it saves you cycles and reduces your operational costs and so on. And another important aspect is to um, enable a sandbox for your API consumers so that they can try uh, they can try out your APIs uh, easily uh, and so on. So um, <clears throat> when it comes to API uh, products, there are two people involved in creating these API products, uh, the API developer and the other personality which we call as the API uh, product manager. 
So developers, as you know, are the kind of people who like to write code, commit it to a repository, and you know, repeat that process. So one of the most important things in in creating this API uh, product factory is to uh, automate your entire API development lifecycle. So this this is a phase where uh, API developers uh, should be able to write their API code and check it in into a repository, test it out, and once it uh, write the code, test it out, and then once it finds uh, check it in uh, into a repository uh, and be done with it. So you should have automation processes that takes this code, um, does the appropriate CI CD, deploys it into the various uh, layers uh, that are in your um, architecture basically, and then hand the job over to the API product manager from there onwards to basically do the uh, business uh, side of things such as attaching the relevant uh, business plans and so on. To your API. So automation has to be uh, something that you have to think about uh, as well. And another key important aspect of a good product is uh, safety. So, uh, <clears throat> so, so we we have lots of ways of securing APIs nowadays. And when it comes to uh, like usability and and um, safety, they don't necessarily go uh, hand in hand. As usually, what happens is the more secure a system is, the le less usable it becomes. But there are technologies nowadays uh, that uh, doesn't uh, really um, uh, have to be so, like uh, things like biometric-based authentication for your APIs and so on, are basically uh, systems where which are more secure than a, like a password-based system and more convenient uh, to use as well. So I've seen many people think about API security just in the sense of authentication and authorization, but API security is uh, is a much broader topic than that. So <clears throat> what you see here is a list of things that uh, you have to do or rather think of um, as you go along, maybe not right at the beginning, but as you go along definitely uh, in terms of securing APIs. So it's not just authentication and authorization. It has to do a, a lot about like things like rate limits, payload scans, uh, surveillance, and looking for abnormal patterns, uh, masking data uh, and so on, right? So it's it's a it's a broad spectrum of things uh, and goes uh, well beyond just authentication and authorization. Uh, and talking about cloud native, so we are in basically now in a phase where we are developing new stuff in the cloud, like obviously for uh, basically for obvious reasons. And and when you're developing for the cloud, basically it's very important to uh, design your APIs. To scale. So earlier when we were deploying uh, stuff on, on VMs, what we used to do is we capacity plan uh, based on our demand and then we provision servers and processors to, to cater our, our peak demand. Uh, but that's not very cost effective when uh, in, the, in the cloud native era because that means we need to have um, servers running um, uh, inefficiently and basically doing nothing most of the time. So you need to design your APIs in such a way where they can scale up and down uh, based on the uh, demand in your market. So that's also another important aspect. And this is where uh, building an elastic data plane uh, matters a lot. So the data plane, as, as I mentioned before, is basically the delivery uh, layer of your APIs to your consumers. That's basically where all of your customers will be um, coming in. So it's important to have an elastic data plane that can scale up and down uh, based on the demand and not just scale up and down, but also scale across uh, different uh, infrastructures as well. So this could be across different cloud vendors, uh, on-prem and so on. So that's also an important aspect. And uh, once you set up these things, it's very important to iterate and improve uh, your API product. So you need to be monitoring for various things. One is obviously monitoring uh, statistical information to see how your APIs are performing, whether they are meeting your business KPIs, uh, the uptime and the, the, the errors and so on. And another very important aspect uh, to keep monitoring is the, the developer uh, NPS basically. So since developers are going to be your customers of your API now, it's very important to get their feedback um, understand the problems that they're going through, their pain points, and keep improving your uh, APIs based on their feedback. So this is where things like lifecycle management, API versioning, and all of that uh, comes into the picture. 
um, and finally uh, think about business models for your API so if you think uh, look at Google search that basically is an example of an implicitly monetized API so you don't directly pay Google search for uh, doing search operations but you give you basically tell Google what you're interested in when you search for stuff and that is being used by Google to for various purposes such as placing ads and so on so although you're not directly paying Google for using Google search um, they are using that API to to uh, gain or earn revenue indirectly and there are also examples like Stripe and, and um, Twilio and so on where the APIs are explicitly monetized where you have to pay uh, as you use the API and monet monetizing an API may not necessarily mean earning revenue at all so putting up an API may also mean that you are reducing some operational costs from somewhere in your organization so that too is in a way um, uh, an aspect of monetizing APIs because you are although you are not earning revenue you are basically reducing the operational costs of, of, of your organization and uh, we WSO2 launched uh, WSO2 Impulse uh, some time back so this is a strategic consultancy initiative uh, that we started uh, some time back so basically we help organizations uh, to align their, their, their people processes and technology and basically create API strategies so if you're interested in, in, in um, getting advice or, or guidance and consultancy on on your API strategies on the technology that you should be looking for and how to align how to basically align your technology to reach your organizational goals uh, we can uh, help you out through this initiative uh, and finally I'd like to end my session by um, this, uh, making this announcement so Forrester um, recently announced the uh, uh, Forrester Wave for API management solutions for 2020, uh, Q3 2020, and uh, WSO2 ended up being a, a leader in the wave along with uh, four other vendors. So if you'd like to download the report, you can, once you receive the slides, you can uh, go to the link below uh, and download the report and, and go through it as well. So that brings me to the end of my session, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to take them now.